Thank you for visiting Pass the Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PassTheWire.com. Thank you for tuning back in. We are back with Ray DiStefano and uh, some more of his racetrack tales. I think this is our third show, Ray, now. Yeah. The first show was supposed to be about Frank Martin, but then we got sidetracked. I got sidetracked. Well, yeah. it's easy, it's easy. Um, and we got so much to talk about. I mean, we haven't even got into the, the Jerry Brody Japan trip and all of that other stuff, but that's all coming. Poncho was your guy. OK, um, he took a liking to you. He was very instrumental in your career. Um, he was an interesting, colorful character. He was he was a, a tremendous part of um, the Cuban. I don't want to say infiltration, but the Cuban migration of trainers that, that so many became great, great trainers and had such a, an impact on, on New York racing and racing all over the country, really. Um said that Jonathan because there's a little story behind that 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 touches on what you just said well but, we'll get to that but let, why don't you stop by telling us how did you meet Pancho and, and and where did it go I just want to say that to in a half hour to give the story of my relation and stories about Pancho what I know and my experiences is like you know in a half hour the history of the civil war and the second and third uh, first and second world war in a half hour. Well, don't do it. Let's do it. Do, do it in two shows. Tell it. Tell it. Don't rush it. You know what I mean? We've we got plenty of time. We'll get out what we can today, and then we'll do the rest next time. And and before we start, and then we'll segue into Pancho, there's another top jockey that I forgot to name. Over two weeks, I named top jockeys that, you know, I worked with when I was on the gate in the golden era. And, and we forgot to mention, I forgot to mention Eddie Maple. And, and um, the funny thing about it is, the people in Pancho's barn, all Spanish. That's how I learned to speak Spanish. My siblings all went to high school and took Spanish in high school and they don't know a word. I didn't take Spanish and, and I speak it because that's all they spoke in the barn. But the, the Spanish guys in, in Pancho's barn, because there was only really at that time, the big writers were Spanish, Velasquez, Vasquez, Cordero, you know, uh, Icaza, Baeza. So they called and they called them and they meant it. Eddie Maple was Eduardo Mopole. That's what that's what that's what they called him. And I'm sorry that I forgot him because he was as good a writer as uh, you know that crew that we've mentioned. Anyway, when we know the story that I moved from Brooklyn and then uh, went down to the gate to the fence and watched the horses and snuck in and played hockey and all of those things. Um, but when I was um, the, in the summer of '66. I was old enough to work. I had now in the spring of 66, I had been sneaking in and going to Neloy's barn and seeing Buck Passer, who just turned three and was the champion two-year-old. And um, uh, But I, I, it was like in April and May. But I wanted to work at the racetrack in the summer. Um, so uh, I was just told, well, go to a barn and, and just ask if they need any help. So I just coincidentally, ironically, the first barn that I came to after jumping the fence, the, the closest barn to my house was Frank Martin's barn. And I didn't know Frank Martin from, from any, any of them. I had no experience. And uh, I go up to the barn, it was training hours and this, um, guy is Frank Martin was standing he always stood by the door watched his horses go out you know on the track looked at their legs he was he just was just such an observer and I go up to this man and I said is the trainer here and he said and he had a very deep uh, uh, voice with a, 
um, Cuban accent. He was very intimidating. And I can't really get that across, you know, in an interview, you know, maybe I'll touch on it later. And uh, it was Frank Martin. And he said, I'm the trainer in that, in that intimidating Cuban accent. And I said, do you need any help? Um, he said, mm, well, what would you like to do? He said, and I knew the word hot walker. That I, 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 had, I knew. And I said, you need a hot walker? He said, did you ever walk a horse? And I said, no. So the horses were walking around, horses that had been out earlier, and he stopped the horse um, that had been walking calmly and um, told a person who was walking the horse to stop. And he said, uh, I, I think he got a big kick out of this, you know, this little guy, you know, coming in, you know, thinks he's going to be a race tracker. And he, he said, just take this shank and just keep making left hand turns. Obviously, you know, you're in the barn, you make a left, you make a left, you make a, just keep making left hand turns. So I made four left hand turns and, and wound up back with the, the horse in one piece, me in one piece, the horse still in my hand. He said, um, Come back tomorrow, you can start to work, but you gotta go to the front side and get licensed and fingerprinted, which which I did. That was, I think, June 30th of 1966. And um, I went that day and got all my, I still have my, um, my original license. And I went back and started to work. And, and that was the beginning of my relationship with him. Um, the only American in the barn and, um, and, uh, he just, I don't know, for whatever reason, he took a liking to me and then it went on to become my really, everybody said my racetrack godfather, my mentor. Um, I had a very, very good relationship with him. And um, you, you want, if you want to get into stories, you know, we can get into stories. If you have any other questions about my early days with him. Well, we'll come back. Like, we'll come back to the early days, but I, I, I want to get a story out there that I think is really. I, I know it already, but I don't mind hearing it again. Uh, really shows the kind of guy he was because, I mean, he was a leading trainer on the New York circuit for a long time. Okay, and he played the game at every level. He 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 claimed horses and had a lot of claiming horses. And also ran in stakes and turned claimers into stakes and private purchase cast off into stakes horses. And there's a list of them that, that we could talk about for days. And he was known as a very, like you said, gruff, um, uh, no nonsense kind of guy. Okay. But he had a really big heart that a lot of people didn't know because if you didn't interact with him, you, you wouldn't know it. But one story that really shows it, that's a racing story, but shows his heart is. Petrograd. That I mean, this I'll is, tell that story because that kind of really shows the kind of guy he was from ultra competitive to a really, really good guy. So tell, tell that story. Pancho was, you know, one of the great claiming trainers of all times. And, um, you know, as you said, he would buy horses from Woody Stevens and from uh, Rondinello and from John Nayrud and um, Alan Jerkins and improve on them. It got to the point where, and I, I don't mean to get off, you know, Rondinello wouldn't sell him any horses anymore. He bought Infuriator and Rube, uh, uh, Prince Dantan. I think it was Prince Dantan, you know, and he did well. Woody Stevens, you know, didn't want Pancho to buy any more of his horses. Autobiography, the Phipps family didn't want Pancho to buy any of his horses because they all look bad. He'd take good horses and make them look better. The only reason why he got autobiography was because they thought he had bowed and obviously had some problem with his tendon. So they unloaded, quote unquote, autobiography, you know, on Pancho and the rest is history. But on the other end of the spectrum, being a claiming trainer, which is what he started and what he's really mostly known for, you know, um, he would claim, uh, you know, horses and move them up, um, you know, and he, he didn't care who he claimed from. Um, and in another story about when he first came here, he was told when he that's first came, right, off a so, certain guy, and that's the first horse he claimed. And the first horse he claimed was from Hearst Jacobs, right. but he claimed from anyone. And he even told Jose, his son, back in the early 70s, they were both vying for a leading trainer. Um, 
71, 73, I, I don't, I don't, I, maybe 73. And Jose kept running a horse, winning, and the horse wasn't claimed. And Pancho told, and he meant it. He said, run that horse back one more time and I'm taking him. And he meant it, you know, and Pancho didn't care who he claimed from. So I'll get to the Petrograd story. Petrograd was a foal of 69. And he was a, a, a nice little stakes horse for the uh, um, Tom and um, uh, Georgia um, Walsh. Tom used to be a, a jumping, I think he might even be a Hall of Fame jumping rider, but he, start, he ended up training. And, um, and he did very well in the mid seventies, he started to tail off. So they dropped him, you know, into the claiming ranks. And everybody knew that Petrograd was Georgia Walsh's pet, and it was hands off. And they kept running the horse um, cheap, you know, and he kept winning, and he kept winning, and he kept winning. And the only reason why I know this story is because I was working on the gate, it was 1976, it was a front side race, and the next race was a front side race. So a lot of times the assistant starters would come down the stairs through the paddock into the tunnel and then go up to the racing secretary's office and just hang out, um, especially if it was winter. So um, the race was over and the next race was front side. So Frank Calvaris and I were walking um, down the steps to the tunnel, heard a lot of yelling and screaming. And this woman was hysterical, hysterical. And what had happened, she was yelling at Pancho for claiming Petrograd. That was her baby. And it was like taboo for anybody to claim Petrograd. And Pancho, in his really deep, you know, imposing Cuban accent with a couple of expletives, you know, told her if, and I'm saying it very nicely, if my mother runs a horse that I like, I'll claim from my mother. If you don't want a horse to get claimed, don't run them for a tag. Now that's really making that G rated. It was a lot of tips. And, and, you know, and he was right. You don't run a horse for a tag um, and get upset. Yeah, you can get upset, but you don't carry on like that. But, but what shows what kind of person he was, he had the horse for a year or two and he did pretty well. And he could have continued, but the horse was like maybe nine years old and he knew it, it was time to retire the horse. Maybe he could have squeezed another win or two out. <clears throat> so he went to um, Tommy Walsh's barn <clears throat> and he told Georgia, come to the barn and take your horse. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the horse still had racing value. He was a gelding, right. he had Italian value. He had some racing value. He could have sold them to Suffolk Downs or Finger no Lakes. Question. No question, he could have shipped him there and would have got claimed, like a lot of guys did, did back then. But he knew how much the horse meant to them, to her. And she came, she got the horse. They had a, a farm out on Long Island and they named it Petrograd Farm. And he lived there happily till he was 32. So you figure if he was nine, Ancho gave him to her. Uh, so nine, 1929, 33, no, 23 years, um, she had him as her pet. So she got her pet back. Let me ask and you she this. wouldn't have. Let me ask you this. Did she ever, to your knowledge, show the kind of appreciation and, and gratitude that you would think she would have to, to Frank after that? I'm sure she did, not to my knowledge. I never heard her. Um, I never heard anybody say that she said this. I never heard her say, but I'm sure that she did. She was very attached to the horse. It's like if someone takes your dog and then gives it back, you, you have to think. So I'm sure that she had a, a real soft spot for Frank Martin in her heart for the rest. She recently passed away. Tom passed away. Pancho passed away. Um, but guaranteed that she appreciated it. And it was something that she never expected um she never expected and it's not like the horse broke down and he needed a home right. still pieces left in him and and that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of guy he was and uh very generous you know every thanksgiving um 
there'd be a truckload of frozen turkeys for everyone in the barn and anybody else who came by. And it seemed like everybody came by. And every Christmas, there was a, a very nice gift for the people in the barn. And uh, one year he gave these beautiful red down uh, uh, jackets. You know, he, he just loved to give. He loved to give. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that he, um, at his own expense, brought a lot of people that he knew from Cuba in the 50s, after the revolution in 59, he brought a lot of those people up here at his own expense. He knew people in Cuba where money talked. He wants somebody, yeah, here's some money, you know, all of a sudden somebody's allowed out of the country. And 90% of his barn were Cuban refugees that he had brought here, even if they, he didn't need someone at the time. He gave all these guys a job. And the, the sad thing about it is a lot of these guys had money down there. One guy had a big restaurant. Another guy had a, a factory that um, uh, they produced rubbing alcohol. A lot of these guys had money and they had nothing. Everything was taken away. But he used his contacts and his money to bring, I don't know how many people here from Cuba and, um, you know, and never said anything, just did it because that was the kind of person he was. He was extremely generous. And um, um, I say the most, maybe the most generous person that I, that I ever met, um, not just on the racetrack, anywhere. Um, um, every, not every week, but every so all of a sudden another Cuban guy would show up. You just got out of Cuba and Pancho had done it and they all of a sudden, and the barn was just full of, of Cubans. Um, I, I can't say enough, but, but some of the stories, he used to go to the caucus. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you about another one, but go ahead, keep going. He, Pakistan stand every morning and um, people would just gather around and he was almost like the Pope in the Vatican up, you know, he used to stand at the top of the steps and he would just talk and he nothing scripted. He was very funny. He didn't try to be funny, but Paracella, Walter Kelly, you name it, Lou Mandelo, you know, all these guys would just stand there and listen to him talk, you know, about anything, about anything. He was, he was like, he was like a magnet, um, so that that always impressed me. And, it, and what it, about the time that he went to? I think it was Mexico to buy a horse. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's a no. It wasn't to buy a horse. It wasn't to buy a. But I have another Mexican story. It was um, he had a Mexican connection who also a Cuban guy, a very wealthy, who had a big farm in Mexico. And he used to help Pancho get horses out. But, but I, you know, I talked to Gregory and, and he said, yeah, maybe we shouldn't tell that story. And it was nothing wrong. And, and Pancho didn't do anything wrong. It was a- It was hysterical. It was, but, <laughs> but I'll give you another one. I'll trade all right. it. All right, all right. Rube the Great won the, won the, um, uh, the Wood Memorial in 1974, right. um, the year after Sham was a, a big three-year-old. And the morning of the race, I went to the barn and people just started to show up, maybe 5.30, and Pancho came. And at that time, the night watchman would just say goodbye to everybody and, you know, and he'd leave. Everybody was there. They didn't need a night watchman. So on his way out, I'm standing at the door with Pancho and um, a couple of other people. And the watchman came out and he said in Spanish, um, he said, Rube the Great is going to win today. He was going to win today. You know how I know? Because last night I had a dream that Rube the Great won. And Pancho immediately, and he was mad. He was mad. And, you know, the, and the way he said it, again, lots and lots of expletives with a really strong Cuban accent. He said, a dream, a dream. You had a dream? He said, you're the night watchman. You're not supposed to be dreaming, you know? So busted the horse one, I mean, you know, he could have fired the guy, but he never fired it. I mean, to get fired by him, you really had to do something. And the people who worked for him worked for him for years. There was very little turnaround. Right. Years, Contreras and Manny and, and O'Connor and Lalo and 
and and then and the list. You, Eddie, you got, Eddie Garcia, a hundred years, I think he worked. Rudy Garcia, you got a job there, you were going to stay there. That was like the gate was a plum job. You wanted to work for Pancho, unless you know. Um, uh, you got it. I I got a job on the gate, and then I got be, before that I got a job with the Murdy Brothers Flying Horses. But if you were going to work in the barn as a groom, a hot walker, an exercise boy, uh, even an assistant trainer, um, that was the place. And he had two, step- two, two interesting things about Pancho. I want to I, I want to touch on one. I want to ask you a lot about because I think people will be interested in it. But before we get to that, a lot of people don't realize, like you said, he was a claiming guy, but. He won a Breeders' Cup race, albeit DQ, in the inaugural Breeders' Cup. Flawlessly. Outstandingly, correct? Flawlessly and outstandingly, right? Oh, outstandingly, yeah. The first the, one was outstandingly. When uh, Earl Scheib's horse got taken down with Pat Valenzuela, I want right. to say Franz Valentine maybe was the name. I don't know for sure. Exactly, um, exactly. And Walter exactly. Guerra, I remember that Walter was the, Guerra uh, rode outstandingly for, for Pancho, Harborview Farm Horse. He had some forces for Harbor View then. Right. Uh, and got put up via DQ in the in all the green stuff. I, and I was there. I saw the race. Right. I was there you with were there with Gold. Gold. Right. Now, let me ask you this. And, I, I know the movie played him so, so wrong in the Secretariat movie. And that movie was just all wrong. If you know the real story and what was going on back then, the movie was ridiculously inaccurate. Okay. But it was a so movie. Rough so. movie. As and they were. I never, saw the rough, I never saw the Ruffian movie. I didn't bother to watch it, but, but I were, did watch the Secretariat movie. And they were both way, way, way very Hollywood, very and. Right. and but I, here's what I want to ask you about that: in the Sham days, okay, Sham. A lot of people say any other year, other than you know coming up against Secretariat, would have been just a spectacular three-year-old, and that's probably correct. It's hard to argue that he wouldn't have been. What do you want? The second fastest derby? You, you, you know, it just, you know. And I always felt like Secretary kind of broke his heart in the Belmont. He was just never, ne- ne- never the same a- a- after that. But what was Poncho's feeling about Sham, about the rivalry with Secretary, if you can call it that? How was, you know, his attitude? Did he think, did he go in thinking he was going to beat him? Did they know how good Secretary it was? What? What can you share with us about those days and what really went on about that rivalry and how it really was to Poncho? Because if anybody would know, it would be you. Well, I was in college at the time. Um, so, you know, I just would be home. I think, you know, this was so, I was still in May for the Derby, but I do remember um, when I got back, Poncho loved Sham and, and Pancho was a perfectionist. I mean, a perfectionist in every, even the way he smoked his cigar, the ash of his cigar was always just perfectly square. His nails were, everything he did with himself, with his horse, he dressed impeccably. But Sham was the only horse in all the years that I worked for Pancho, autobiography, Hitchcock, Rube the Great, Prince Dantan, Accipita, on and on, Hitchcock, the only horse, his store was right out of Pancho's office and it had one of those velvet ropes like when you go to the movies right. and you had to away. You had to stay. You couldn't go pet him. He had his own exercise, right? Obviously his own groom and he had his own hot walker. I never got, I never walked Sham. Uh, guy, Jose Luis was the only one who could walk. So Pancho was a fanatic about Sham, which told me that he really thinks this horse is special. And um, I think at the beginning, he thought that he was going to be able to beat Secretariat. Maybe after the Derby, he realized that this is a, this is a good horse. But he always, always loved Sham, you know. And I think, um, you know, they say Secretariat broke Sham's heart. It might have broken Pancho's heart, too, because he expected b- big things. But the movie portrayed him horribly. He was very polite to Mrs. Tweedy and uh, all throughout. And... It just made him look like a real sleaze bucket, and it and it really hurt his feelings because that wasn't him. That wasn't him. So um, anyway, I wanted to go back to um, another story that I had. Uh, you know, I, I think there's just so so many. Um, you know, Pancho was the kind of guy who couldn't um, 
couldn't sit still. You know, I remember in the times that I worked for him, you know, he bought a, a restaurant in Franklin Square, not too far from um, Belmont. And I would go out after, you know, he, he always wanted somebody. He loved my company. And I don't know why, but I go for a ride with him and um, go to the restaurant and sit down. He'd have the cook uh, uh, make me some kind of Cuban. But it was Frank Martin's um, Turf and Field. And it was only open for a little while because he never, it was all racetrackers and he never let anybody pay, you know. Every, you know, give me the check. He never let anybody pay. You can't stay in business that way. And he bought Ralph Smith Van Company and he bought new uh, uh, Mayor Haven Farm, Dr. Reed, whose hospital that Ruffian was operated on, um, on Plainfield Avenue. Dr. Reed had uh, the Mayor Haven Farm in, in Kentucky and uh, in Florida, in Ocala. And Pancho bought Mayor Haven Farm and made it <clears throat> New Haven Farm, so he got involved in farm. You know, he just had to stay involved. He got in, involved in breeding for a while. He, uh, went with uh, with Pancho and Dr. Belden and uh, Bill Bennett from the Van Company, just because he wanted company. We went to Kentucky to the sales ones, and he bought some mares. And uh, um, you know, he he used me as his pedigree guy. Um, and I was young, but you know, I did understand pedigrees and he used Belden, Dr. Belden, I guess, to look at the horses and I used Bill Bennett to arrange shipping when he bought a horse, but he always had to stay busy. You know, when he left the uh, barn in the morning, he, he had to do something. And I remember um, he went on vacation with Charlene and his wife, young Gregory and, um, uh, young Charlene, I don't know, in the 80s or whatever. And um, it was the only vacation he took in all the years that I knew him. And Charlene told me once, or Gregory, that he was miserable. He was miserable. I mean, he was away from his horses, even though he had people in the barn. He had guys in the barn, like his brother was assistant trainer, a guy in Puerto Rican, guy named Connie, who was assistant trainer. He had grooms who were... Um, who could have been top trainers. They were that good of horsemen, you know, but they either had no opportunity or some of them had drinking problems, but his help, a lot of his help were, were just as good as most of the trainers, you know, out there. And um, uh, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, now, now I just, um, I lost my train of thought because there's just so many things. I want to go back to when he came here. Um, he came here in the 50s and he went to Ohio and he couldn't remember the name when asked sometimes of the first horse he came up here. They supposedly came with $500 in his pocket. I don't know, but he came up with one horse. And I'm pretty sure I remember the horse's name was Constant Aim. And um, he went to Thistle Downs and then he went to New England and Ended up. Try and look while, while, while you keep talking. I'll be back in a second. Go ahead. I just want to see something. Go ahead. Okay. And and he he ended up in New York, and he was the first Latin trainer in New York. And he, I was talking to Gregory this morning, his son, who I'm still very close with and talk to a lot. And he reminded. I knew the story, but he reminded me more detail. He really opened the door for the Cuban or the Latin trainers to come here. He came here like, it was almost like um, uh, when Cordero came here and started to ride, you know, being black and, and when um, uh, 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 Jackie Robinson played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, you know, having, this was all blue bloods. And now this Cuban guy is very gruff. He's, uh, he's infiltrating. So he came to New York and because he was so dedicated, motivated and, and such a powerful figure, you know, he settled in New York and the story, he was told, okay, just don't claim from Hearst Jacobs. Boom, first horse he claims. And Pancho was instrumental. Gregory reminded me, I knew it, but I forgot it and I wouldn't have brought it up. Pancho was instrumental in, in the influx of a lot of these, the Las Barrera, his brothers, Guillermo, uh, Oscar, Willie, um, uh, Willie was Guillermo, Luis, um, a lot of these Latin trainers 
were able to come here because he opened the door like Jackie Robinson for black players and Cordero for, for, for black jockeys. Pancho was instrumental in, in the influx of Latin, not just Cuban. And here's a story that, that people don't really know. He was instrumental in getting Laz Barrera here. Laz went to Mexico you know, from Cuba. He thought there was more opportunities. And Laz was a big time trainer in Mexico, but he wanted to come to New York. And Laz grew up with Pancho in Cuba. And he asked Pancho, can you help me? And Pancho got him Gustav, remember Gustav Ring? Yes, and a, absolutely. And a, he fam, Zara Alexander. And, um, but he got him Gustav Ring and he set him up with tack with buckets, you know, he set Laz Barrera up. People don't know that. And in 19, and, and, and there was competition throughout the years with Laz, you know, here's a guy he brings and sets up, but he's getting all the limelight. He, you know, he wins the triple crown um, and, and they were competitors, but they were friends. And, and in 1979, um, I was sitting I used to go after schooling, go to the barn and just sit in his office. He just liked company. And, and, and I was sitting in his office and the jock agent came in and he announced, they just elected Laz to the Hall of Fame. And you could see on Pancho's face, the hurt, you know, the disappointment, the jealousy, I don't know, you know, that, you know, he had been overlooked. And he said in Spanish, very vulgar, you know, F the Hall of Fame, um, you know, I don't care, but he did. He did care about that. Right. Was, he said, I don't care about trophies. I don't care about the Hall of Fame. All I care about is my money, my money. And, but, but that was just a, 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 a sham, no pun intended, a smoke, a smoke screen because he was hurt. And two years later in 81, when he was elected, there was no happier guy and 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 as deserving as anyone. Laz just made 40, it. 47 million in purses. A 17% win, win percent, 17 plus just on hay, water, and oats. And, um, uh, you know, he knew his horses. And, and I remember a couple of days before Jose was to run um, Jose Bin in the Arlington, Washington fraternity, the horse was dead lame. He was supposed to ship and the vet couldn't figure it out. X-rays, you name it. Jose went to Pancho and Pancho went to the barn. That down, you know, he, when he got down on his knees and he looked at a horse's legs, I mean, and nobody really could see what he saw. He was a, a magician with legs and feet. And he looked and he looked, and he took a little pebble that was in, you know, embedded like in the outside of the tendon of, of um, Jose Ben, the horse was fine. Went to Arlington and he won. Nobody could find it, he found it. And when a vet came to the barn, they always did the vet work in the middle, Pancho would stand there with his arms folded like he was a teacher. And the vet's doing his work and you know, Pancho observed, no, no, no. And, and he, it was incredible. And a lot of times he would do his own work. He'd get there with the, with the uh, uh, the, the, the tool that you, you know, um, you do the horse's hooves, but I can't right. remember, you know, and he'd you know, shave the hoof, take out a little piece of gravel that he'd find, you know, that would, he, he was, he was incredibly good horseman. Um, and, uh, you know, no education, just, and they say his brother Isidore, was just as sharp, but Isidore had a drinking problem and, and, and never had the opportunity. And Connie, his assistant trainer, had a drinking problem, but these guys were just as sharp as him, you know, just as sharp as him. I, I, you know, I had so many stories that I wanted to tell, um, you know, but I get so wound up and, and I know that I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on, on many, Maybe. Listen, we got plenty of time. We'll come back next week. We'll do more poncho. You'll, you know, maybe write a couple down for yourself during the week when you think of them, so we could, we we could we could talk about them. Um, he was certainly a, a colorful character, and I 
I don't think, I mean, I get it. He's in the Hall of Fame. He won $47 million in purses, came here with nothing, built literally a racing empire. Uh, his grandson, Carlos, is a successful trainer today and a gentleman, if okay, not the nicest guy as you could be. Uh, you know, just, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think he gets his, I, he gets credit for, you know, the Hall of Fame and everything he accomplished on the racetrack, but but how influential he was in, in American racing by bringing so many people here, um, the Barreras and, and just uh, yeah. you know, the, the way he was one of the first truly power powerhouse claiming stables. I mean, there were others, you, you know, Buddy Jacobson, yeah, but, Jacob, but he was one of the, you know, the first just dominant claiming stables that also competed in the stakes ranks, like we said, claiming trainer won an inaugural Breeders' Cup race. You know what I mean? You don't say that about many, quote, claiming trainers, you know? No, but but he had success with bigger horses, the, the ones he could buy, but then a lot of these trainers didn't want to sell him. Turn and Count, remember Turn and Count, Manasseh Mola, there were just so many claims he that claimed- he won stakes with. For ten thousand dollars and won the Wood Memorial. Right? What twelve was five. Manasseh Mola. He took the twelve five and for won the Wood oh. Memorial. And won the won the Wood uh, Memorial. Wood, Wood, but a lot of these trainers, Rondinello said no more. Phipps wouldn't sell him on it. They sold him a, a bow, a bold horse, and they thought they were getting rid of him. You know, Woody Stevens stopped. You know, ex- Exhibitor and uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 I, I, you know, all these names, but all these. I, I remember Bob Moisen Farm, who was the Kellys, if you remember. He took oh. that horse 10 below. And Ten be- the, 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 the Lawrence realization went to yeah. Del Mar, went to Eddie Reed. I mean, just, you, you, you know, and like you said, hay oats and water back then. I mean, not even Lasix. Lasix was not allowed back then. And ironically, and we can get into this another second. I sold um, 10 Below to Australia as the stallion prospect because after, I, I, that was another part of my career, selling stallions, that right. if you want to get into that as, at another point. But, but there's just so much to say, you know, uh, Jose passed away, you know, but should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, Gregory is now pin hooking and he's got an operation in Ocala. I speak with Gregory all the time and just spoke with him this morning. And uh, he's been very successful with some of the horses he buys. To, you know, I to- know Glo- Gloria, Gloria is, is, is involved in that as well. And, and they've got and a specific Jer- whole Ho- operation going. Jose, um, Carlos is training. And um, yeah. so, you know, the, the, um, the name Martin, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's literally a legacy in racing. And, and I think, you, you know, a lot of the people that are involved in the game today don't realize what the Martin name meant or means in racing, but it's truly a legacy. And for a, a, a student of the game like myself and somebody who lived through that, and I'm sure you feel the same way, it's great to see them all still involved in having that on, on, on different levels. You know what I mean? Gloria doing what she's doing, um, Greg doing what he's doing, Carlos doing what what, what he's doing. Uh, it's it's great to see, you know, they're they're they're, they're a stamp on the sport. They really are. It's great for me to still be in touch with all three of them. They were much younger than me. They were babies, you know, when when um, I started to work when I was working for their father. But they know the bond that I had with their father and grandfather, Gregory's father, Gloria and Carlos's grandfather. And they know, you know, that I'm my, as a race tracker, yeah, I flew horses, I worked on the gate, but they know me as, you know, Pancho's other kid or godson. And um, even he, he, do we have two more minutes? Yeah. He, he loved my parents. Um, my father would come, get horse manure for his tomatoes, and bring Pancho back big things of uh, basil. And um, and my mother would invite them over, Pancho and Charlene. He loved Italian food, and my mother would cook. You know, uh, you know. First it was at Cassius Mucin, then it was Pancho and Charlene. 
and they came over quite often for dinner. Um, uh, and my mother was born in Italy, so obviously, you know, Pancho enjoyed everything she made. And then to return, he used to have them out, take them to restaurants, restaurants that they would never go to, you know, right. they were able to go to, you know, and me, that's the third wheel would go along. Um, so, you know, he, they were good to him. If you're good to him, he can't re reciprocate enough. So, so yeah, my father got manure, Pancho got, you know, basil plants, you know, Pancho got a, a, a meals at my mother's house, but then they went to some pretty fancy restaurants that they would have never uh, got to experience. And um, I remember at my mother's wake, Pancho was there um, with Charlene and he just said, your mother, this is an exact, exact word. She was a little doll, a little doll, a little Italian woman. And, uh, and uh, you know, they loved him, he loved them and he had a lot of respect for them. And as you know, anybody who respects your parents or your children, you know, you don't need anything more than that. And, 100%. 100%. So anyway, there's so much more, you know, about Pancho that, um, um, you know, I don't know if you want to continue it, if you want to well, come up. Listen, it's up to you. You've got a million stories. As long as we get the, 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 the phony Jerry Grody autographs in there at some point, I'm happy. because That's, that's, that's way down the road. That's way, way down the road. <laughs> But uh, um, I hope I'm asking the people watching, I'm asking you, I was kind of all over the place today because there's so much. And I told you earlier this week, I, I texted you that my mind was spinning. This, this is a relaxed show. You know what I mean? It's for people that enjoy this kind of stuff. Don't worry about that. You, you know what I mean? I said, you're going to keep me from getting, God forbid, Alzheimer's because my mind is so active thinking of stories and I write things down and I remember how could I forget this you know I, I just want to do him justice I mean, I, and we'll get to this there's maybe four or five people on the racetrack and they're all dead now who I would say were very instrumental whatever level I achieved in this industry I would say these are four or five people but Pancho was by far the number one um, mentor godfather and uh, and friend and friend well, so we'll, we'll have more on him for sure and, and we'll, we'll we'll get to everything else um one day i want to do a show on uh we'll, we'll kind of go through a lot of your memorabilia you know some of the stuff you got rid of already some of the stuff you still have people may want it they may contact you who knows we'll see what we'll see what, we'll see what happens um but we'll be back with more ray thanks enjoy the day you too. Um, thank you so much for sharing this stuff with us. Uh, I love it. You know that. Um, I hope I hope people enjoy it. It's, it's, it's great stuff. A lot more to come. Just hope um, I wasn't all over the board today. You know, nah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's very a little bit, and sometimes I feel like I, you know, I'm uh, talking it's, something and I'm thinking of another story. It's an informal show. Um, it's often it's uh, what do we call it? just us friends only here. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? It's that it's that it's that kind of show. And uh, we all love this stuff. So, and, and where else are you going to hear about a track, a track vet finding a buzzer on the, in the dirt and shocking himself? You're not going to hear that anywhere else. That alone is worthwhile. And, and, and they heard it. Yeah. I got some, <laughs> yeah, like the guy in Mexico. That was another classic story. But well, Greg doesn't want to share that one. I thought it was funny. And and I, 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 it, it you know? had nothing really to do with his father, but no. out of respect for the old guy. And, and I've gone over some of these stories with Greg and, right. and, and I want to, he approves most of the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So Gregory, thank you for, you know, being my producer. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Ciao. Thanks. Bye-bye. How'd it go? You there? Nobody does it better.